We'll make a start. A couple more people just okay. That's fine. Oh, now I feel doubly bad that I didn't bring Totoro's. There are kids here. Oh. <laughs> oh, I feel super bad. <laughs> Okay, I think we're just about ready to make a start. Welcome, everyone. Uh, I just want to let people know that this is actually part of an event put on by the Cultures Research Centre uh, based in Leica. I'm Richard Rushton, the director of the Cultures Research Centre. We try to um, essentially back up and collate uh, work done on theory and history by staff uh, in uh, Leica. Uh, and we also aim to hold some events uh, involving visiting speakers, but also speakers uh, from within Lancaster University. So please keep an eye out for events um, that we have on. Um, I'm pleased to welcome Professor Raina Dennison, but I'm going to hand over to Zoe Crombie, um, PhD student in Leica, who's going to do the sort of proper introductions. <laughs> yep, so hi everyone, I'm Zoe Crombie. I know quite a few of you already, but there's still some faces in here I don't recognise, which is wonderful to see that Ghibli's managed to kind of gather so many people here today. Um, so here is Professor Raina Dennison. Um, she's the Head of Department in Film Studies at the University of Bristol, um, primarily researching kind of anime, Studio Ghibli. Um, and this is a chapter, as I'm sure you'll explain, uh, that was kind of sadly not able to be included in her recent monograph, uh, Studio Ghibli and Industrial History, uh, which is a fantastic resource for anyone who's researching the studio, whether kind of academically or otherwise, if you just want to learn more. Uh, so I'll hand over to Raina now and yeah. Fantastic. <laughs> thank you so much, Zoe, and thank you, Richard, for inviting me up here. Both of you, thank you. I've got a mic. I'm oh, great. Can you all hear me? Yeah? Great. Wonderful. Um, and to anyone joining us online, welcome to this talk. I think you're seeing my PowerPoint in the room right now. Uh, so apologies that you can't see me. We've had a couple of technical issues starting out. But I wanted to say that this is a work in progress very much. Um, Despite the fact that I've just published my book, as Zoe pointed out, um, Studio Ghibli and Industrial History, there were aspects that due to the pandemic, I didn't quite get to finish off and do. So this is one of those. Um, and I hope you have a lot of fun with it tonight. There will be some wonderful um, images coming up and some really strange and wonderful things. Uh, so I hope you have a wonderful time. So, in the very unlikely event that you've never heard of Studio Ghibli. Ghibli is a Japanese animation house and the home for nearly 40 years now to films from directors like Hayao Miyazaki and Isao Takahata. Outside of Japan, Ghibli's probably best known for its film Spirited Away, which won the Academy Award in the early 2000s. But inside Japan, Ghibli is a very different entity and that's something I've been writing about for quite a while now. Um, inside Japan, Studio Ghibli is basically like a mini major studio. It does all kinds of things. Of course, it makes some of Japan's and Japanese animation's most famous big blockbuster animated movies. But more than this, Ghibli runs two successful theme parks. It has its own DVD and publishing imprints. And crucially for this talk, Studio Ghibli is the source of a merchandising and licensing empire that's yet to be fully mapped or understood. So today I want to make the case for Studio Ghibli's merchandising as unusual within Japan's crowded anime goods landscape, not least for items like the one you can see on this slide, which is a full-size Totoro chair that you can come in and sit on, um, which is just wonderful and completely tempting. Um, <laughs> But Studio Ghibli is, is unusual in that landscape, and considering how um, such merchandise helps to produce a sense of distinction around Hayao Miyazaki's films and characters is really my purpose today. 
So, for those in the know, <laughs> one of the big claims about Studio Ghibli in Japan is that the studio was able to move from its temporary rented accommodation in Tokyo um, that they secured back in 1985 when the studio first began to a Hayao Miyazaki design studio building on the outskirts of Tokyo, um, which looks like, oops, sorry, one of my slides has dis oh, there we go. I went too far, sorry. Um, so this is the Hayao Miyazaki design studio that was um, built, purpose-built for the Studio Ghibli. In 1992, it opened. So then and up till about three weeks ago, Studio Ghibli has been a privately owned company, which means it's not had to publish its profits lists to share or costs to shareholders. And this is one of the reasons we know so little about Ghibli's empire of merchandising. The studio has chosen when, where, and how much to talk about its successes on the screen and beyond. So yes. Merchandising haunts the margins of my book, Studio Ghibli and Industrial History. I wrote the majority of the book during the tail end of the pandemic, as I mentioned, when I sadly couldn't get back to Japan regularly to finish off what I had planned as an amazing chapter that would chart like literally a geographic walk through Tokyo, going to all the shops that Studio Ghibli had merchandise in and talking about like an autoethnographic approach to understanding Ghibli's merchandising empire. Um, sadly, I've, I've not had the chance to do that for the book, but what I wanted to do today was think about that since I've been back this summer and have discovered some amazing new and really kind of challenging aspects to Ghibli merchandising at the Ghibli Park, which I will talk about towards the end. But I also wanted to think about how Japan's merchandising landscape has been changing over time and has been maybe impacted a little bit by the pandemic as well. So for me, this talk really starts with Anne Allison, who pioneered discussions of the relationship between Japanese media companies and their surrounding merchandising empires. In, particularly, in particular, Allison outlines the history of the relationship between Japan's media industries and the toy industry in the following terms. She relates that the toy business in Japan became, uh, began directly after the Second World War, but then, and I quote, by the 1960s, the domestic market for toys had grown and was shaped in part by the new business in character merchandising. This involved the marketing of goods and toys um, based on characters who, in the 1950s and 60s, were mainly television characters, and by the 1970s, increasingly came from manga. In the 1970s, as we all know, I'm sure, Sanrio began its Hello Kitty line, which stimulated the rise in miniature, um, cute consumer products referred to as fancy goods. And she continues, character branding has become trendy, even fetishistic in Japan today. In part, this is because cute characters are appropriated as symbols for identity, personal, corporate, group, or national. I think Totoro fits really well with Allison's definition. He acts as Studio Ghibli's mascot. He appears in the studio's logo as its main character. He features as a special case in their licensing practices, being the first character that the studio licensed to toy ma manufacturers, as we'll see in a moment. So I will dive into thinking about how merchandising has shaped anime and Studio Ghibli in a moment, but just a quick note um, on a more general methodological point before I do so. Tracing the history of Ghibli's merchandising is not as easy as Totoro and the other characters from Ghibli's ubiquity in Japanese consumer culture might indicate. Indeed, across 30 plus years of history, multiple countries and inconsistencies in licensing practices, such a study necessarily encompasses um, and presents challenges within ubiquity. Furthermore, by revealing and obscuring its own history by turns, publishing copiously on the histories they want us to know about, while completely eluding others, Studio Ghibli has left a tangled legacy for us to unpick. And by not discussing merchandising in as much depth as other aspects of their filmmaking, for example, um, tracing Totoro's history in toys presents a series of challenges. So recognizing these challenges, my approach for this talk begins from a materialist, I'm sorry, this is, very, this is the only theoretical bit, we get into just the cute stuff in a second. Um, 
My approach for this talk begins from a materialist and reception historical methodological approach, especially those provided to us by work in production studies by scholars like John Caldwell and film historians like Barbara Klinger. In, in this particular instance, however, tracing Totoro's history in merchandising also aligns with Anne Allison's work and is subtended by important interventions by other scholars of material media history, not least Caitlin Benson um, Allett, whose work on film and television as material culture tells us that film and TV have meanings beyond the screen, that we are, as we engage with the products off screen through merchandising and other things, Found fundamentally changing our approach to the world. So with the production of blockbuster films and franchises based on toy lines from Transformers to Barbie, I think these links between film culture and material culture have become increasingly pressing topics for our consideration of late. Not least because, as Lincoln Garrity has argued about Star Wars toys, and again I quote, the collecting of Star Wars action figures and other merchandise bought on and sold online at conventions or in stores is about objects in motion accumulating human and social significance as each object comes to be in the possession of an individual with their own story and their own individual reasons for buying and collecting. Film objects like a Totoro plushie are essentially then additive. As we keep them, we create new extended meanings around them, enhancing their significance in our lives and also in our cultures. So I don't know how many of you know about what about um, how Japan Airlines and ANA in Japan tend to skin planes with anime characters, but this is just one famous example where um, Pokemon took over one of the big airlines. So um, merchandising provides us with a useful window onto individual and industrial politics, therefore. Japan has, as Allison notes, developed its own sophisticated system of media merchandising. And in his compelling book on this system, titled Anime's Media Mix, Mark Steinberg has argued licensing of character-based goods has become a cornerstone and has been a cornerstone of anime history since Astro Boy or Tetsuwa no Tomu took to Japanese TV screens in the 1960s. Steinberg has introduced a new way of making sense of anime's perpetually extending networks of television, film, and merchandising by introducing the idea of media commodities into the media mix theory. And you can see that quote up here on the slide. I won't read it out in full. But as Steinberg argues, it's a dual process in which media objects influence media texts and vice versa. In anime's worlds of media commodities, then, character is the engine that drives the materialization of anime as merchandise, with Steinberg arguing that merchandising gives characters a cultural ubiquity reflected in Japan's industrial recognition of the kiara, or character business. This is my, my second favorite example today. This is the Totoro toilet mat. Um, Ian Condry takes this idea of the media commodity a step further, using media ethnographic approaches to the anime's industrial licensing of contemporary anime characters, arguing that characters provide a locus for anime's cultural commodification, through their ability to cross between and even beyond media texts. In this, he observes that it's the commingling of character merchandise and the spaces in which they appear that can best help us understand the collaborative nature of what he terms anime creativity. For Condry, then, anime creativity is an eloquent expression of the coming together of industries, character merchandising, and fandom in Japan that places characters at the center of a broad network of media mix franchising practices, reinforcing and enabling the creation of toys and other merchandise as those media commodities that Steinberg talks about. So the figure of Totoro, I want to argue, has become such a broadly reimagined, multiply reimagined media commodity in Japan that the character's presence even on a mat that goes beneath a toilet can be read as helping to re-immerse fans into the wider fantasy worlds that Studio Ghibli has built around this, their most popular character. But one of the most challenging aspects of researching Studio Ghibli is that this animation company is almost always an exception to anime's rules. And Studio Ghibli's approach to merchandising is absolutely no exception to this rule of thumb. 
For instance, the mat first materialization of Studio Ghibli's characters began without a straightforward commodifying agenda. This image is from a 1988 issue of Animage magazine, a specialist magazine edited by one Toshio Suzuki, who went on to become one of Studio Ghibli's founders, <coughs> excuse me, and um, was working for Animage, which was then owned by Ghibli's parent company, Tokuma Publishing. So in this image, we can see the first ever Totoro plushie, a 30 centimeter tall, spiky green eared and pointy nosed version of Miyazaki's softer, more rounded character. You can see it's, it's almost threatening those ears, they're great. <laughs> So 100 of these toys were given away by lottery to lucky fans who purchased the soundtracks for both Miyazaki and Isao Takahata's 1988 films, My Neighbor Totoro and Grave of the Fireflies. And you can see those pictured above. The same stuffed toy, I love this picture, it's one of my favorite of Miyazaki. <laughs> um, the same stuffed toy can be seen in another giveaway less than a year later, pictured on this slide. Miyazaki appears in this issue of Animage magazine, goofily holding onto a trophy when readers crowned My Neighbor Totoro as the year's best anime film. His note of thanks to readers states, um, the works I have made recently have protagonist characters without star quality. And that he's surprised by the fact that readers would have found star quality where he had intentionally thought he'd included none. So I love this because it's Miyazaki's first declaration of surprise and denial about the success of his characters and films within the popular media sphere. Um, and it's part of a discourse that Miyazaki has maintained ever since, that he doesn't make animation to make money but in order, or in order to be popular, but rather as art. Compounding this early expression of Ghibli's artistic drive is the comparative lack of Totoro merchandise that accompanied the movie even a year after its release. The studio had previously done tie-ins for others of its movies, as with soft drinks that were emblazoned with the logo of Castle in the Sky in 1986. But by comparison to other anime studios, Ghibli was slow to license toys based on Totoro. Further, that this earliest Totoro merchandise was just given away and was intended as a reward to Ghibli's growing fan base and was exclusively non-commercial in nature works to set Studio Ghibli's earliest toys apart from other anime character goods, which were easily purchasable in this period at Japanese department stores and to toy stores across Japan in the 1980s. So the giveaways done with postal submissions for lottery winners to win these toys was also a means by which the young Studio Ghibli, through Tokuma Shoten and Animage, could track the depth and breadth of their growing fan base. In the example on this, uh, this slide, exclusivity and collectability drive the reward come lottery with five lucky voters receiving the promotional Totoro plushies, while an additional two uh, received a soot sprite and Totoro themed camera as thank you presents for their votes. However, from these non-commercial starting points, Ghibli moved into merchandising quickly. This is where Studio Ghibli's only book-length publication on its merchandising strategy can offer some crucial insights into their approach to recreating Totoro as a media commodity. The magazine book called Full of Totoro, or Totoro ga Ippai, was released in 1995 and offers an overview of Studio Ghibli's collaborations with specific craft and art worlds in their merchandising of Totoro, in addition to a useful list of licensed merchandise, which I'll talk about now. So I am still translating parts of this. I was back in Japan in August and I haven't had a lot of time to do translation since, but I'm working on it. And here's what I've got so far. So from the numbering system at the back of this book, we can see the first half dozen and more licensed goods were all different sizes of that gray Totoro plushie um, that you can see on this slide, uh, ranging from about 27 centimeters high to over 100 centimeters in height. And as of 1995, that, addition, that initial production slate had expanded to the point where there were over 160 different Totoro goods for you to buy. And that has only increased since. And that, inco that includes some really unusual things. Um, I have some of them in my office. So um, for example, Totoro plushies that have a hole inside them in which you can insert boxes of tissues. 
Um, so you're pulling tissues, alien style, out of Totoro's stomach. Um, and you've got other things like the bath mats I just showed you, but also keychains and phone charms and things like that. So it's a wide range of merchandise. And according to the Full of Totoro records, this merchandising began in earnest when My Neighbor Totoro was first broadcast on Japanese television at the cusp of the 1990s, so it had little to do with the film's initial release. And this is when a new licensor called Sun Arrow um, was allowed to create a full line of stuffed Totoro toys, which quickly, after that broadcast, sold half a million units within a couple of weeks. Sun Hour confirms this information on their website, and that's just a little excerpt from their website. But for them, Studio Ghibli is just one client amongst many, which includes other animation studios like Ardman Animations from the UK and other internationally popular children's product lines, such as stuffed toys based on the children's book, The Very Hungry Caterpillar. <laughs> so their work is really diverse, and Studio Ghibli is, while one of their bigger clients, only one amongst many. Another immediate observation from the Full of Totoro book comes in the form of gender identity within merchandising. So the gendering of labor around the creation of Ghibli merchandise is, I think, fascinating. Though Sun Arrow was at the time headed by Masaaki Seki, who you can see pictured on this slide, um, surrounded by the 1995 Totoro merchandise that was available, the real person behind the scenes who was important to the history of Studio Ghibli is this amazingly angry looking woman on the left here. <laughs> the R&D department at Sun Arrow was in fact dominated by women and led by chief designer Kyoko Kamei, who's uh, fearsomely glaring at us um, from this image on, on the left here. Women then were at the heart of the early merchandising design strategies for Studio Ghibli, but always a step removed from the centers of power and decision making. This alongside Studio Ghibli's reputation in the early 1990s for making women-friendly animation. Um, the 1990s, early 1990s saw a trilogy of films released all claiming to be women-centered and focused. Kiki's Delivery Service, Isao Takahata's Only Yesterday, and then weirdly, and I can talk about this in the questions if you want, um, Porco Rosso, which is a film that centers around an Italian flying ace who's been transformed into a pig and is very definitely male, but ask me why that's a feminist film at the end of this. <laughs> um, so I think this helps to explain some of the merchandising choices that may be being made in the early years of, of Studio Ghibli's media commodity lines, which were very definitely focused towards women. Other important observations emerge coming from Ghibli too. Um, despite his reputation for disdaining the commercial side of the animation industry, those working in Ghibli's merchandising department remember Miyazaki actually having fun with the merchandising products in these early moments. For instance, uh, Shokichi Arai remembers Miyazaki putting on a prototype Totoro costume and striding around the studio in front of his staff, excitedly telling them, I made something interesting. Um, Arai works hard here to connect Miyazaki to Sun Arrow's licensed goods, and in doing so, I think, suggests how Miyazaki's insistence on his animation as art has always been, at least in part, a performance. Moreover, uh, these early efforts resulted in numerous hit product lines, suggesting that Ghibli's merchandise was, in fact, crucial to their success in the, er in the company's early years. So through the merchandising around Ghibli, uh, sorry, though the ver merchandising around Ghibli films began with Totoro, their licensed goods have proliferated ever since, uh, certainly since the 1990s onwards. The official film pamphlets sold at Japanese cinemas, I think, offer us a demonstration of how Ghibli's <coughs> merchandising practices have developed over time, but have always remained quietly alternative to the norms of anime goods in Japan. So on the left of this slide, for example, you can see the merchandising line presented to us for Only Yesterday, which features the, char the central character, Tayako. And these are beautiful porcelain fig you know, figures that are retailing for around like $70 or 50, like $30 to $70. So they're not particularly cheap goods. And on the right, you can see that by 1995, with Nini Osumasaba, Whispers of the Heart, 
there are some really unusual and interesting items starting to appear. Um, there are two that I would like your help with today, um, in case you know anything about this. This is a pitato. Um, I have tried translating this. If there are Japanese speakers in the room who know Japanese culture and grew up with it, maybe more than I have, I've looked it up online. I've looked for similar toys, and I cannot find anything else like this. I don't know if this is a spinning top or if this is maybe a, a character that comes apart that you can stack. It's really, that's all it says about it, is that it's a potato. Um, it, I can't see it well enough. That's as blown up as I can make it. Um, so over to you, audience. If anyone's got ideas, I would love to hear. The, another of the things I really like from this period, though, are... Um, things like this medal, which is a really unusual bit of merchandising, both of which feature um, the shape of Muta, the cat from uh, Whispers of the Heart. Um, now, cats and Ghibli, again, if you want to talk to me about Ghibli merchandising and cats, please do so uh, in the questions. I would love to talk about that more. So the media commodities here involve, uh, sorry, uh, include what we might think of as more standard things, um, for example, keychains, fans, plushies, posters, and postcards. However, in that mix, there are always these unusual items. So subsequent films have experimented in more diverse ways with mer merchandising. For example, Isao Takahata's My Neighbors the Yamadas from 1999 had a range of neckties, you can see um, just here, um, which were themed to different characters. In addition to, uh, what, and I love these, bobblehead characters, um, so bobblehead mascots, and also more traditional goods, like the um, Emma or votive plaque that you can see just on the right there. So I think these lines of merchandise, oh, and um, the ones on the right are from The Wind Rises or Kaze Tachinu by Hayao Miyazaki. And because of the aeronautical theme of that movie, unsurprisingly, there's a whole range of model airplanes for you to collect. Mm -hmm. So these lines of merchandise are especially interesting because of their lack of longevity. Few of these items remain available as licensed goods today, creating an ephemeral imper imperative to collect. In doing so, Ghibli has managed to create a kind of managed scarcity um, around its collector's items and generated, therefore, a collector's market around its film-related product lines. It's not always easy to predict which characters from Studio Ghibli movies, and I'll just pause that before, if I can, before it makes everybody dizzy. Don't know if I can, no. Okay, there we go, oh, no. Sorry, everybody's just gonna be dizzy. Um, so it's not always easy to predict what's gonna happen. As you can see in the image on the slide, we have Princess Kaguya from Kaguya Hime no Monogatari by Isao Takahata from 2013. And that movie is set in the Heian period and would be a perfect way of being adapted into traditional Japanese culture via things like the Hina Matsuri or the Dolls Festival, the Girls Festival in Japan, which you have dolls that are ready-made and kind of purpose-built to mim and, and which Kaguya's design was intended to mimic. That didn't happen. There weren't toys like that made. Instead, it was Kaguya Hime's um, childish consort at court who became the focus of merchandising. So you can see their coin cases and um, bags and hair bobbles and things, um, just loads and loads of merchandise around this, based around this secondary kawaii or super deformed ch chibi versions of this already cute, kawaii cute um, character. So I think these kinds of Surprising choices are another thing that sets Ghibli apart. It doesn't always follow the straightest path to merchandising. And anyone who's ever seen the merchandise for Ponyo uh, will know this. Um, the main toys from that included bath toys with Ponyo eating a slice of ham that you could wind up and run from one side of the bath to the other. Um, fantastic toys, but not maybe the first thing you would think of when you're thinking of a high quality Studio Ghibli film. In addition to straightforward examples of licensed good and goods and merchandising, some of Ghibli's cinema pamphlets have also been signaling ancillary tie-ups and sponsorship arrangements. These are commonplace within Ghibli's history, and um, I've spoken more about these in my book chapter, 
looking at Ghibli's history of advertising in Japan. Um, and for example, they date back to Kiki's Delivery Service, where the Yamato Delivery Company became a major sponsor, or when food companies became sponsors for Takahata's Only Yesterday, which features multiple scenes of a family sitting down and dining together. But more recently, these arrangements seem to have become more complex and to have deepened. In a particularly complex variant of cross-promotion, Ghibli, uh, <laughs> Ghibli partners sorry, with sponsors House Foods, and you can see an example of their advertising together on the right. <coughs> so house foods are best known for their home curry sauces in Japan. And together they ran a campaign called Enjoy Your Dreams, combining Hiroyuki Morita's The Cat Returns and house food products. And this included TV commercials, ads like this, but also, as this advertisement explains, a series of um, products that the two companies worked on together. So these were exclusive goods that you could pick up just at the time of the film's release. In another similar example, the Lawson, the ubiquitous Lawson convenience store chain, ran an advertisement in the cinema pamphlet for Miyazaki's Ponyo, saying how they were supporting the brand, but at the same time advertising an exclusive line of their own, Ponyo merchandise only available through Lawson convenience stores um, that would be available only for a limited time in Japan. Merchandising in these examples happens not through simple licensing practices, therefore, but reflects Ghibli's deeper industrial partnerships and corporate interrelations. So, while managed scarcity is one facet of Ghibli's collector's market, there are, of course, others. The distinctiveness of Ghibli's merchandising has also come from its unique collaborations with a wide range of craftspeople, designers, and artists from all over the world. These kinds of collaboration are relatively commonplace in Japan. Anime characters can be found everything from high-end fashions, expensive jewelry for men and women, and even cars. Um, I don't know how many of you know Case Closed or Detective Conan, but that 10-year-old character has been seen advertising cars in Japan. So it's not even necessarily age-related associations that are important. It's the power of character within these moments. So for example, um, Arai writes that in the 1990s, um, Ghibli was making a new style of Western style ceramics that it was producing in conjunction with famed Japanese <coughs> ceramics house, Noritake. And one of this ongoing collaboration's most recent lines is pictured here on the right. So that's been going for well over 20 years. Meanwhile, the Academy Museum in Los Angeles had exclusive art lamps that you can see here that celebrated their inaugural special exhibition on Hayao Miyazaki. Um, and in the early months of 2023, London became the home of a pop-up collaboration between uh, Howl's Moving Castle, Studio Ghibli's Howl's Moving Castle, and a partnership between them and the brand Lowe. These kinds of exclusive merchandising and brand collaborations emphasize artistry and quality while also separating out Studio Ghibli from what we would think of as the normal spaces and types of anime merchandising. And uh, that might be my favorite, one of my favorite advertising images. <laughs> so the Low, and I'm sorry if I'm mispronouncing that, I'm not actually sure how you say that brand name. The Low and Ghibli collaboration I think is particularly interesting for the way it inserted elements of Miyazaki's Howl's Moving Castle into one of London's most famous retail spaces, as well as a pop-up boutique in the famous Selfridges flagship department store. There was also a pop-up cafe and cinema screenings on its lower ground floor. In an example of the importation of media mix strategies in which an IP is exploited simultaneously across multiple sites and media, the collaboration interpreted Ghibli's Howl's Moving Castle, turning it into a range of experiences and consumables reflecting the deep ways in which anime can become embedded within material culture. And that brings me to the shops in Japan. So further evidence for Ghibli's distinction within ubiquity can be found in its licensed Donguri Kyowakoku chain of shops, which sell Ghibli merchandise exclusively, um, usually, Ghibli merchandise across Japan and now also in Hong Kong, Shanghai, and other parts of China. These stores offer fans an exclusive space in which to consume Ghibli products, as well as offering character replicas with which fans can interact. And I, I would never take that kind of cheap opportunity, but uh, for research purposes only, this was the Nagoya shop. 
These stores, as Ian Condry suggests, become quasi-immersive brand consumption spaces, allowing Ghibli's fans to experience Ghibli's animated worlds through elaborate materialization, born out of merchandising world-building constructs. So the continuity, um, the continuing centrality of Totoro within these expanding worlds of Ghibli media commodities can be seen in the, uh, the Dongori Kyowakoku character goods product catalog, <gasps> which is hard to say, um, from 2003, which I have found a copy of here. Um, so I've managed to locate what, this one from 2003, and it contains over 230 different Totoro items some of them in collectible ranges, such as the entire range of Totoro-themed ear cleaning devices, which you can see in the top picture. Um, and also, um, uh, you know, things like men's, really expensive things like men's pajama or lounge suits, which retail for upwards of $300. So they range, too, from contemporary branded goods for modern living, such as light switch covers, through to more traditional metal tea kettles and tea caddies, as well as celebratory festival goods like those pictured on the bottom left of this slide. So what this range confirms for me is the opportunity for such goods to enable fans to brand elements and aspects of their lives with Ghibli products, albeit far removed from the on-screen initial experiences. The consistency and dominance of Totoro within this effort demonstrates the character's close ties to Studio Ghibli's brand identification and meanings. If we look at just three of the Donguri Kyowakoku stores, we can start to see some commonalities emerging, some trends. There's an emphasis on natural materials in their displays and in their shop fronts, as seen in the Sendai shop here on the left, um, aligning with Ghibli's reputa reputation for environmentalism. There's also an emphasis on Totoro as a presence and photo opportunity as customers arrive in stores. In newer shops like those in Hong Kong and Shinsai Bashi Osaka, three-dimensional scaled recreations and replicas of famous scenes from Miyazaki's My Neighbor Totoro welcome potential customers into the retail space. Once inside, the emphasis is on character goods intended to speak to everyone from infants, so there are things like rattles and baby bibs, right through to adult men with things like rucksacks and ties, um, to every age um, of women, young to adult. Objects in these spaces include fashion accessories, clothing items, and both expensive and inexpensive jewelry, an example of which I am wearing tonight. This is the Prince Ashitaka ring from Princess Mononoke. I will send that round for people to have a look at. So, the expensive jewelry will retail for hundreds of pounds, if not uh, more. But things like that, uh, earrings, necklaces, and rings are sold at really affordable prices, anything from like $10 up to about $25, $30. And by the way, I think that's still available on the um, website that I'll talk about in a minute. <laughs> So homewares also make up a significant proportion of the goods on display, as in the calcifer spatula from Howl's Moving Castle, pictured here, but also those bath mats and traditional seasonal objects. It's these seasonal goods that I think, and traditional merchandising products, that I think really make Ghibli's licensed character goods distinct within the anime merchandising marketplace. Though many popular anime have seasonal goods, Ghibli's licensing lines are now extensive enough that Dongori Kyowakoku produces exclusive limited time merchandise on a near monthly basis. So Dongori's seasonal merchandise also ranges in types and prices from the you know, $10 um, Totoro watermelon keychain that was available this summer to more high-end objects like the Spirited Away incense burner you can see at the top there, retailing for more like $60 to the Totoro um, themed uh, which is lovely, the moving music box from the summer of 2016. Additionally, there are lines that are packaged for particular special events. So this is the Mother's Day um, flower gifts from 2016. And taken together, I think the fast-changing ranges of goods with their emphasis on special dates within the calendar, seasonality, and traditional Japanese arts and crafts signal the topicality and specialization inherent within... Um, 
sorry, um, inherent within Studio Ghibli's licensed goods, together with their blink and you'll miss them ephemerality. It's these seasonal and traditional merchandising products that make Ghibli's licensed character goods truly distinct within the anime merchandising market. Though many popular anime have the, oh, sorry, I'm just reading the same thing again. I do apologize. Um, for, so from this brief historical overview of Ghibli's licensing practices, I can think we you can see how the studio attempts to extend its films through merchandising, producing distinctiveness. Ghibli's distinction emerges out of the exclusive and limited spaces and kinds of merchandise it makes. So none of these spaces are more exclusive nor more distinctive than Studio Ghibli's museum and recently opened theme park. The Studio Ghibli Art Museum in Mitaka is home to two shops. The first is a bookstore celebrating um, publications coming directly from Studio Ghibli's own publishing imprint and giving away copies of the studio's newsletter or journal called Nepu. While the Mama Ayuto store, named after the Sky Pirates and Castle in the Sky, features a wide range of merchandise from everything from puzzles and DVDs through to plushies, um, to, uh, yeah, which include plushies of like distinct characters only seen within the museum, to bespoke rosters of Hayao Miyazaki created um, merch that is kind of coming straight from the short films they also show at the museum and the most expensive items they sell, um, things like jewelry are sold there, like silver and gold jewelry. The museum also has, for my money, a too small cafe that features foods that have been giblified by virtue of paper plates and um, kind of being named after popular characters. And this again is a major, the anime cafe has become a major thing in Japan. And so Ghibli has their own version of it. But, it is at the new Ghibli Park that Ghibli's merchandising and promotional narratives have reached their zenith. The Ghibli Park is important not least because it's part of a site repurposed from the 2005 Nagakute City Cultural Expo, um, where you can see they made a replica of the house from My Neighbor Totoro. So they built this version of Mei and Satsuki's house for that event. Um, and then when they were looking for a space in which to have uh, their first theme park, this was a, a natural extension of that relationship. So um, I think this is really important to take note of because, of course, the expo ties in perfectly with Studio Ghibli's brand, the expo's theme, of course, having been the environment. So inside Ghibli's theme park, we have the main warehouse exhibition space. And there are many reminders of the studio's general style and films. Um, so like that tile work you can see there, there's little soot sprites in amongst the tile work and things like that. But in addition, they have this. So this is, I think, the most obvious permanent display um, that connects back to Satsuki and May's home and connects back to Totoro. This is um, about exhibiting Ghibli's famous scenes, and it offers viewers um, people going to the park an opportunity to engage with the movies directly. <laughs> I'm so sorry, I did get a picture of it, of this scene without me in it. I'm so sorry, <laughs> grinning like an idiot. Um, so one of the more elaborate displays in this exhibition allows visitors to imagine themselves in the home um, as it would have appeared in the movie, My Neighbor Totoro, and to stand alongside the girl's father, Tatsuo Kusakabe, in his study. Now, I think this is the most interesting thing about the park, and I'll, I'll come to other things that are interesting in a second. But this study was packed full of all of Miyazaki's inspirations for My Neighbor Totoro and for other Ghibli movies. So there's a statue of a tanuki raccoon dog, um, and this is right next door to the Pompoko display, so there's a nice through line there. But it also contains um, Jomon pottery sherds um, and a kind of replica style necklace in the style of Princess Mononoke, a sans necklace from Princess Mononoke. So the space is almost literally a reminder of the many ways Miyazaki has folded Japanese history and culture into his films, um, showing aspects of Japanese culture he has consumed as part of his creative practice. The shop at the Ghibli Museum Park contains a range of bespoke merchandise and you, know, you can get green Totoro with hats, for example. Um, and if you take the trouble thereafter, thereafter to kind of climb the acorn or dongri hill, you get to this attraction. And again, I think this is the second most interesting thing about the park. This wooden Totoro replica 
is the Ghibli Park's third incarnation of Miyazaki's My Neighbor Totoro and is a profound variant on Ghibli merchandising. Not because of the plushies that you can buy that look like this, but because of the small hut you can see in the background of this picture. Many of you will know that My Neighbor Totoro has been closely aligned to Japan's nativist tradition of Shinto animistic religious practice. In the film, Tatsuo takes his daughters to venerate a large camphor tree in which Totoro is making his home. Here we can see that invocation almost inverted or reversed, a tree made into a Totoro, and then a shrine shop sitting alongside it. The shop works to commodify Ghibli's literal enshrinement. It sells Ghibli-fied versions of Omomori protective amulets emblazoned with Ghibli characters, including Totoro. It also sells the kind of Jib, um, traditional crafts like sacred arrows that are burnt at New Year in Shinto rituals. In this way, the attraction works to insert Ghibli through commodification and commercial practices directly into one of the country's longest standing and longest practiced religious traditions. If literally enshrining Ghibli were not enough, in recent years, Ghibli's Dongori Kyowakoku has also gone international by going online. In this way, the studio's ephemeral character goods are becoming ever more dispersing ripples spreading outside of Japan, as amongst Ghibli's wider attempts to assert their artistic merit through things like museum exhibitions. Christine Reiko Yano has argued that Hello Kitty's shift into online retail spaces has added simultaneity to the brand's cultural ubiquity. To borrow a phrase, going online has, made, has meant that Hello Kitty appears on everything, everywhere, all at once. Through studio, and I'm sorry, that's a much overused phrase at the moment. <laughs> Through Studio Ghibli shifts into um, merchandising in these ethereal spaces, I think it's a similar kind of expansion effort. But these efforts can also be read as a reflection on the studio's continuing ambivalence towards the commercial. And the results are intriguing, and I want to pick out a couple of them for you here. The online shop, um, Soro no Ue Ten or Soro no Ue Mise, um, is, features not just um, kind of what you might expect, like Ghibli branded goods and collaborative goods, but also does something important. So you've got these kinds of things, the JBL My Treasure and Dongari Closet, which are about clothes and goods, the kinds of things we've been talking about so far. But there's another brand here, the Totoro Fund National Trust, that's doing something entirely different. Goods purchased through that label help, as the strap line tells us, to fund Ghibli's environmental protection efforts. So the Totoro Fund is um, based around the Sayama Hills preservation efforts that have been going on for the last couple of decades. And this is the area that Miyazaki has specifically said inspired my neighbor Totoro. So you can see here Ghibli literally putting its money where its mouth is and selling merchandise to help raise funds for the environment. So in this way, charitable efforts can mingle with the baldly commercial on the Donguri Kyowakoku online store, helping bolster Ghibli's reputation for environmental activism while simultaneously helping the studio to maintain its own profit margins in between expensive feature film productions. So to bring things to a close then, it's useful to use Ghibli's varied merchandising practices as a way to literalize the meanings the company is seeking for its films and by extension its corporate brand. The studio's media commodities which range from the near sacred and explicitly environmentalist to the commercial if not exactly the profane, that I leave to fan producers, become ways of rehearsing the corporate aims that the studio has. Totoro's centrality to these efforts by now I hope is clear. Uh, the character dominates Ghibli's merchandising landscapes, both in the real world and online. The only Ghibli character that comes close in popularity in terms of merchandising is Gigi the small cat from Kiki's Delivery Service. But the prominence and dominance of Totoro goods is, I hope, clear. Nevertheless, the sheer variety of Studio Ghibli merchandising of Totoro and its alterity as demonstrated in this slide's images is remarkable. It helps to generate a world of Totoro, one that contains meanings, uh, the meanings of Studio Ghibli in its simplistic or simple iconic imagery. The world of Totoro contains within it an emphasis on nature, on tradition, and on craft that works to distinguish Studio Ghibli from other kinds of Japanese animation studios. By connecting with artists, designers, and craftspeople, moreover, Ghibli has been emphatically demonstrating 
its brand commitment to distinctiveness within Japan's crowded anime marketplace, making its world of Totoro all the more distinctive as a result. More so in having bespoke goods in specific locations, including its theme park and art museum, Ghibli has been careful in orchestrating an understanding of itself as associated with quality, artistry, and immersivity by turns. The world of Totoro merchandising, therefore, contains within it Studio Ghibli and vice versa, making merchandising a key facet through which Ghibli's most famous, uh, sorry, through which Japan's most famous animation studio is defined. And I'll finish there. <laughs> Thank you. Well, thank you very much. That was absolutely fantastic. I'm sure everyone here agrees, and I hope they all got a good chance to look at that ring, because it's really gorgeous. I, I might have to get one myself. Um, so I thought I'd take this opportunity now to open up the floor to any questions. So if anyone has a question that they'd like to ask, just raise your hand. Uh, why is Porco Rosso a feminist film? So... Um, Read my book. Um, <laughs> so as the story goes, um, Porco Rosso was supposed to be an in-flight entertainment of about 20 minutes that was being done for Japan Airlines. Um, but then Suzuki left Miyazaki in a room on his own for too long, and Miyazaki turned it into a feature film. <laughs> this has been a pattern that Suzuki and Miyazaki have followed for about 30 years, so it's not uncommon for this to happen. But it is a really interesting moment, because at that moment when Miyazaki was ready to make the film, the production on Isao Takahata's Only Yesterday was running late. And again, if you know anything about Takahata, you know that's completely normal for Takahata. But what's interesting is because Miyazaki didn't have his usual collaborators to hand, what he did was actually reached around the studio to look at who the best people were for the jobs that he needed done. Key animation, character design, those kinds of things. And he actually promoted women instead of men. So that is why Porco Rosso is, for my money, Studio Ghibli's most feminist film. It's nothing to do with the content and everything to do with who he gave a chance to in that movie. So it's a really important moment for women at the studio, unusually. Um, sadly, none of them retained their positions. They tended to disappear back into other roles. Some of them left the company over time. But one of the things that I noted in that chapter was just how much better women talked about it being working at Studio Ghibli than working at other companies. So big animators, I think Maki Kofutaki is amongst them. She does all the beautiful natural imagery in Studio Ghibli, like the little pool of tadpoles in My Neighbor Toshiro. That's her. That's not Miyazaki. That's her. She's brilliant at observing the natural world, and that's really her thing. Um, all the safflowers, the lovely orange flowers from Only Yesterday, that's her. She spent like a year just drawing flowers for that movie. Um, but she's one of the people who is, has a prominent role on Porco Rosso. And I think it's her that talks about how at other anime companies, they would work through the night, wake up in the morning, well, like work through the night, get up in the morning, throw up, and then just get back to work. You know, it wasn't, a, you know. And Ghibli in a crunch period is bad too. There's plenty of behind-the-scenes documentaries showing the kind of head of animation at the studio working all the way through the night, even when Miyazaki's gone home at 10 o'clock. You know? So it's, it isn't an easy place to work. But I think in terms of doing what is right by women, it's tried by doing things like it has a crash on campus. Um, so it's doing things to make itself more open and friendly, family-friendly as a result. But of course... I haven't found a single woman directing a Ghibli film, not even an advert. Mm -hmm. So there are limits to the studio's feminism, sadly. Yeah, and there's that statement that Toshio Suzuki made at one point, wasn't there, that women are too grounded and men are more imaginative, and that's why they're superior directors, which is an interesting kind of reversal of the usual misogyny that you hear, I think. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. Any more questions? Oh, yeah. No, I haven't seen it yet. Oh, no, actually, yeah, I did. Of course I did. <laughs> what am I saying? I thought you were talking... Sorry, in, in my head, you talked about Spirited Away because I know that's coming up and I want tickets to that one. <laughs> um, but, yeah, no, I wrote the insert for the blurb at the Barbican, yeah. <laughs> and they very kindly gave me a ticket as a reward. Yeah, it was... It was re that's, 
a fascinating production again, um, particularly for what it's done for Asian puppeteers in the UK, because it's it's really a production, puppeteers and actors in the UK, it's been really good for them as a community because it's given them a space to work together and have a really big collective impact. A follow-on question from that. Sure. Um, you mentioned that a lot of the merchandise was produced quite in limited editions and therefore you, um, you described it as being ephemeral. Theatre by its nature is an ephemeral um, product. It is sure. it's a live performance. So I wondered how do you think that the ephemera of limited edition merchandise and then theatre production, how, how those relate do you think? So I think you can use art as a line through all of this. So the licensing of the, the Barbican RSC production from Studio Ghibli came through Joe Hisaishi, um, the one of the main composers for Studio Ghibli. And he kind of approached Miyazaki and said, you know, the RSC wants to do this. And Miyazaki said, not unless you're involved with the adaptation. So it, they, they kept it very close to being in-house in some ways. Miyazaki and, and um, Joe Hisaishi have worked together uh, go on, someone help me, since Naushka, so that's the 1982, 83, because so, he was composing before it came out, yeah. Yeah, so they've worked together for a very, very long time. They know each other really well, and so he was seen as a safe pair of hands to guide that production through. Um, I mean, it's a really interesting question in a lot of ways, because merchandise is meant to linger as long as you collect it when it's available, and then it lasts in a collector's market, so it's ephemeral but not ephemeral. It is material culture, it lasts. But at the same time, it, having those limited runs, having limited, I mean, I was really pleased when, um, when Totoro came back to the Barbican and they started announcing it wasn't, the first run would not be its only one. Because again, it helps to extend that connection and really makes an important statement about the popularity of Totoro as a character, but that production as well is just fantastic, you know. I cried, it was great. <laughs> um, I have not cried about the merchandise, sadly. Um, but I think there are, there are some fantastically unusual things. I think I may have oversold the ephemerality because there are some goods, like that calcifer spatula has been available in the dongari shops for at least eight, nine years now. So there are some goods that linger. There are some kinds of product that linger. But there are also these seasonal lines that are blink and you miss them. Like literally this one on the, the slide at the moment is there for the summer of 2023 and will not be available again. There'll be a different iteration of it next year. Yeah, I think it's interesting that you raise the theater productions as well, because I believe that it was actually today in the United States that they've released Spirited Away or a version of it on Blu-ray. Oh. Um, so that is becoming somewhat more accessible. I'm not sure if they're doing the same for My Neighbor Totoro or not. I, I would assume so. Yeah, they're also doing the live production over here. It's traveling over here as well. Ah, yeah, yeah. fantastic. So there's, there's some ways to kind of get your hands on that at least, as opposed to, I mean, one of the things you talk about in your book, the shorts at the museum, which are only available at the museum and very hard to kind of access otherwise, if not impossible. Including the sequel to My Neighbor Totoro called May and the Kitten Bus. <laughs> which I have still never managed to see. I've seen the same, like there's seven or like, or maybe like 15 of these movies, but yeah. I've seen the same three, like two or three times and never seen May and the Kitten Bus. Yeah. Even if you go 20 times, there's no guarantee you'd yeah. see them all. It's yeah. tough. <laughs> you have to plan your trips as to when the short film is that you want to see. Anyway, <laughs> you need to get onto doing that. Uh, any more questions? Yeah. Yes. Were, um, private company. Is there a change? <laughs> yeah, I, I don't know how. <laughs> it's hard to know what people will know, but Studio Ghibli was. So, Studio Ghibli has had a long time partner in Nippon Television. Um, they created its ident. They, you know, they've done all kinds of work together. That's where My Neighbor Totoro was broadcast. And about three weeks ago, they sold the company to them. So, NTV now owns Studio Ghibli. And I don't, well, that was the announcement. Yeah. I'm not sure quite what the limitations are on that. Mm. But you have to remember, you know, Suzuki is in his 70s, Miyazaki's in his 80s. You know, they don't necessarily want to be running a company anymore. Mm. Yonibayashi's gone off elsewhere, yeah. yeah. <laughs> so there, were, there was a breakaway group when they temporarily shuttered Studio Ghibli in 2014. 
there was a breakaway group went off and started a new studio called Studio Ponuk, which made Mary and the Witch's Flower and a bunch of other movies recently. And Yone Bayashi, who was like the, sec the successor to Miyazaki, that's where he went, along with a bunch of other people. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. If the match were moved to the Western world, to the side of the road, what do you take within <coughs> everything that you can interpret mm -hmm. from the movie? Because there's a bunch of interpretation that is actually very culturally situated. Mm -hmm. So if you don't understand well Japan and the ways, maybe you'll be a bit lost in, in those. Yeah. And then everything that happened loses its meaning. So I was thinking if you purchase this, I don't know, Totoro Trotty, <coughs> does the Western world understand it, what it means for her? Yeah, no, this has changed over the course of my time <laughs> doing research on Studio Ghibli. Um, before Studio Ghibli was on streaming platforms, I used to have lots of fun with my students because every year I could go to Japan, bring back the new DVD of the latest movie and be like, hey, global premiere. <laughs> and we'd have fun with that. But now there's, again, the films are available anytime anyone wants to watch them. And for, like for the last two or three years, I've finally had students coming in going, yeah, this is my favorite Ghibli movie. I'm so excited to watch it again. I've watched it like 12 times, you know. <laughs> And, and it, inevitably, it's one of the three same films. It's usually My Neighbor Totoro, Spirited Away, and to a less ex lesser extent, maybe Howl's Moving Castle. Mm -hmm. Sadly not. <laughs> but interestingly, <laughs> that just might be my students. <laughs> it's, it's, it's not, a, it's not a, like a properly sampled sample. But um, <laughs> one of the interesting things about Princess Mononoke, of course, is when it came over, they had some trouble marketing it. Um, so Disney did the marketing, or rather Miramax did the marketing for it. And when it came out, it came out to like successful but slightly qualified reviews. People weren't quite sure who it was for. They thought it was very violent. Yeah. What's been fascinating, and Emma Pett has written a brilliant um, chapter in a book I wrote, uh, edited about um, Princess Mononoke on this, is how... Princess Mononoke's reputation has changed over time. Mm -hmm. It has emerged from amongst Studio Ghibli's films as the one with the highest feminist reputation mm -hmm. and the one mums want to show their daughters. <laughs> and Emma's research demonstrates that beautifully. She's done audience research and reception research to look into that. And it's just such a lovely thing to see changing over time as the movie's been accepted and embraced by Western mm -hmm. audiences. But to go back to your question, I think... There are a couple of things going on there. So when the Disney, uh, sorry, the Buena Vista International Tokuma Shoten deal, not the Disney Ghibli deal, was done in 1997, 96, 97, it didn't include merchandising. So Disney could bring the movies over, but they could not merchandise them. And, and it was Ghibli that held on to the rights for merchandise. And it's only been since about 2014 that I've noticed a real uptick in international licensing from the studio. So that suggests maybe that that's when they're thinking, oh, the studio's slowing down, there'll be fewer movies, so let's do more merchandising, let's sell more of what we've got. Um, so they start doing things like, I don't know how many of you know Hot Topic in the US? Yeah, some good nodding from the cult scene here. <laughs> um, so it's a cult movie kind of, um, store chain in the States and they, they have their properly licensed Studio Ghibli goods. But largely until about the 2014 period, what we were getting here in the UK for Ghibli merchandise was based on fan art okay. or it was based on um, imported off-brand goods from Asia. Um, so a lot of stuff initially was coming through China. China does do Ghibli merchandising. That's where a lot of the merchandise is made. But there are also places making unlicensed goods. <laughs> um, so there was a lot of, I mean, I'm, that is where the production is done for Ghibli's merchandise, is, is China. That's the hub for it. Legitimate and maybe not so legitimate. <laughs> but what I love, I mean, and again, there's a really great article, and I'm going to forget the author's name, but there's a really great article, James Rendell is his name, um, looking at 
what fans have done to promote Studio Ghibli in the absence of licensed goods available outside of, of Japan and Asia um, up until the last few years. And it's just brilliant. Everything from Ghibli baking, which there are some amazing cakes on the internet, um, <laughs> through to Ghibli knitting and crochet, you know, really interesting ways where fans have started crafting in the absence of those craft-oriented goods that are all over Japan. So it's a really exciting space, yeah. I just, I just need to ask you really quickly now. It's been raised. I'm afraid. What's your favorite? What's your favorite Ghibli movie? So mean. Um, <laughs> I mean, the one I've done most writing about over the years, including my PhD, was Princess Mononoke. Um, but I remember, like, I remember when the studio shut in 2014. An American animation group did this brilliant, kind of, jokey video song, talking about bye bye Ghibli goodbye. Um, and in it, they've got this brilliant line saying, you know, everybody's got a favorite film, and it's usually the first one you saw. Mm. And interestingly for me, Princess Mononoke was not the first one I saw, because when I was learning Japanese, our language teachers made us watch My Neighbor Totoro in language class, which was also a joy, but they didn't tell us what it was. They were just <laughs> like, watch this scene from this movie and translate it. So I translated Studio Ghibli before I even knew what it was. <laughs> uh, mine is Whisper of the Heart, just to, to oh, trade yeah, you, but you not the first I saw either. And, and interestingly, because I love it so much, I really struggle to write about it. Uh, yeah, <laughs> also the problem. <laughs> uh, yeah. I wish I knew. I literally have, like, I cannot find anyone talking about that. And if anybody does find anyone talking about it, please let me know. Yeah, the studio has been, because it is privately owned, it doesn't do an annual report. It doesn't have to talk about who it's licensing what with. So you end up doing a thing where you find an article that mentions Sun Arrow and then you trace it back to their website. And it's that kind of game of hide and seek, trying to find this stuff. NTV does do because it is um, a shareholder-owned company, it does do annual reports. So it does talk about the popularity of Ghibli on TV. But in terms of the licensing, <clears throat> literally the only thing I have is that book from 1995. Um, there's a few other mentions of licensing in Animage over the years. They do something called Ghibli News, um, unsurprisingly, because <laughs> it's owned by the same company that used to own Ghibli. Um, but in that, they only rarely talk about that. But that's, again, that's the only place I've been able to find any written information about things like the TV commercials they've been making for more than three decades now. You know, that's fascinating too. The, the, lack of, the lack of information really frustrates me. So if anyone finds good sources, let me know. <laughs> I don't know. They literally, it's just been the last month and they haven't said anything about merchandising in the announcements. And I don't even know what shape that's going to take, whether it's a custodial kind of arrangement where NTV treats Ghibli like a library of product that it can exploit over time, or whether it's an active production arrangement where NTV are going to put money into new Ghibli um, movies. It would be nice if they did. Um, typically what happens in Japan is once the major directors resign, retire, or pass away, the studio goes into what I've been calling a library mode, where it looks to exploit as far as possible and to sell it to as many regions as possible. And that's certainly what happened with people like Osamu Tezuka's Mushi Pro. Um, and it's, that's just been an arrangement going on for decades now. But I'm not sure what will happen here. And I think that's you know, one of the reasons Ghibli is the gift that keeps on giving. Like Every time I think I'm finished with this kind of project and I'm done talking about Ghibli, there's another new big announcement, another new theatrical adaptation, another new. Every time I, fin I think it's done, there's something new about it. And I think, for me, that's one of the most exciting things about Ghibli. I'm never quite sure where it's going to go next or what kind of thing they're going to do next. 
you know, so they'll do major global concerts with Joe Hisaishi at the helm and their live opportunities to see Ghibli performed. But there's not a sense in which they seem particularly interested in taking their merchandise and putting it into high streets outside of Japan. I'm just not getting the sense that they're doing that. They had a pop-up shop in LA a few years ago, but that's the only thing I've heard of in recent times. Um, and that, I think, was a little bit of market testing before the exhibition at the LA uh, Museum of Movies. I've forgotten the date. Museum of Movies. It's the Academy, Academy Museum. Museum. Thank you, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Museum of Movies, what? <laughs> yeah. yeah, the Academy Museum. <laughs> Any other questions for anyone? Hi. Hi. I was wondering if you have any thoughts about the marketing for the toy in the house. Or lack of marketing. Of yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, um, those of you who know what happened this summer, Toshio Suzuki and Miyazaki have had a long standing argument that's raged on and off in the press, so probably not a real one about whether or not Miyazaki's films are brilliant and sell like blockbusters in Japan because they're just genius artworks, or whether it's actually Toshio Suzuki's brilliant marketing campaigns that have helped them become blockbusters. Um, this manifested first in the news around Princess Mononoke's release in 97, 98, um, and it's just rumbled on ever since. So apparently, according to the things I've read, Miyazaki convinced Suzuki not to promote the Boy and the Heron to prove once and for all that it's Miyazaki's art in animation that causes this, his blockbuster successes. But of course, if you think about a movie marketplace that is crowded with animation the way Japan is, not advertising is a marketing stunt. <laughs> so, and only Ghibli, pretty much only Ghibli could get away with that. Like, I don't think Makoto Shinkai's films could get away with that, even, even with him breaking blockbuster records in Japan. It's, it's about this constant refrain of this being the last Miyazaki movie. And again, I have been hearing that since 1997. <laughs> yeah, he has retired so many times and he's already back. It's already been announced that he's working on his next film. I was reading about a fantastic conversation that was recorded years ago that I'm sure you've seen between Miyazaki and um, Kurosawa, oh, yeah. uh, the yeah. director of Seven Samurai, for I'm sure most of you know, um, where they kind of share their, their mutual desire to just never stop making any movies, and Kurosawa's last work being called, like, Not Yet, in answer to the question, Are You Ready to Die? Yeah. <laughs> it's a very similar kind of feel you get from them as people. Yeah, absolutely. These are people who have movies in the bones. They, they will not stop. What forms those movies will take, whether they'll be short or whether they'll be feature films, it's hard to say. I think Miyazaki has now decided, well, at least the, the story with the boy and the heron is that Suzuki let Miyazaki have the budget he wanted and the time he wanted to do that movie the way he wanted to do it, which is unusual. And you know, usually there's a really hard ceiling on a budget. So they're very lucky it's turned out to be the biggest box office opening weekend they've ever had. Um, but what was interesting to me, just to bring it back to merchandise again, is when I got to Japan and went to the dongari stores this summer, I expected, despite there being no marketing, to see a full roster of Boy in the Heron goods. There's nothing. Nothing. Not even the soundtracks. Not in the dongari Kyowakoku shops. I mean, when you go to the cinema, you can get the, the kind of cinema pamphlet and a poster, but again, not the usual things you would see. And for the first time, I think, yeah, for the first time since the 1990s, if you get the cinema pamphlet, there is no merchandising in the back of it. So again, this was a really unusual movie for them. And it's got brilliant characters in that are perfect, ready for merchandising. And I, you know, I'll be interested to see if they kind of later on introduce some merchandising around it, because there's, there's got to be a demand for it. It just has to be. I would buy it, so I'm sure everybody else would. <laughs> Any other questions to finish up? Well, in that case, I, I have one. What do you think makes Totoro such a good kind of icon for the studio? What, what is it about him? Um, he's something that is already kind of working to the principles of iconicity within character design. So 
He's got large eyes. As you can see, he chibifies very nicely. That idea of super deformation is really easy with Totoro. He's also a, a conglomeration of familiar animal types. Mm -hmm. So part owl, part bear, part cat. Um, and I think that helps as well because he's somehow familiar even though he's a complete fantastical creation. Um, and I think the role the character plays in the movie is also really important. It's a nurturing character that is there to support children. So that makes him a good toy. <laughs> I'll admit I was listening to some of the tracks from Totoro when I was coming over here and I saw a comment on a YouTube video that said I cried because I'm too old to meet him. So I hope that person's doing all right now. <laughs> All right, so if we have no more questions, then I think we'll close it up. And I think another round of applause for Rain, who's done a fantastic job here. Thank you all so much. This has been really wonderful. Thank you for yeah. the excellent questions and for listening. I know it's quite warm in here, so thank you for staying awake, too. <laughs> yeah, feel free to, as Richard said before, there's refreshments uh, and to stay for a bit of a chat. So, yeah. That's fantastic. It was plugging you in there that I hadn't oh, seen before. Yeah, there was lots. I'm like, I, I love him. He's a watermelon. I love him. He's fantastic. <laughs> I took so many pictures this summer that I think that's my favourite. Did you get some of these things as well? So we didn't. I got one of these. Um, so they have... Um, that I, I should have just picked one up when I saw them. The last shop I went to didn't have them. But they have these kind of uh, vegetable toppings. Oh, where they're little kind of vegetables with toppings. <laughs> I'll crack open one of the bottles of wine. Thank you so much. <laughs>